All right, let's turn to Genesis chapter 32 because we're talking about being servants of the Lord. And I want to share with you a story of maybe one of the most dramatic transformations in Scripture. This is the moment where a schemer became a servant. Genesis 32, 24, I want to ask you to leave your Bibles open. We're actually going to be backing up a little bit to lay some foundation as we go through the text. Bible says in Genesis 32, 24, Jacob was left all alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. Pray with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to receive every drop of what the Spirit of God has for us today, Lord. We don't want to miss anything that you say. I want every servant to receive all of your counsel, all of your instruction, all of your direction, and all of your commands. And we ask, Father, in Jesus' name, that you would be present in this place, Lord. Father, by your Spirit, just take control of everything that happens in this house. We'll be careful to give you all the glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jacob's name, the name meant deceiver. How would you like that name, right? Try to sell used cars with that name. He has spent two decades of his life at this point working for his cousin Laban to marry Laban's daughters. Now, he only wanted to marry one. He worked seven years for this young lady named Rachel, and Laban tricks him, and in the morning he wakes up, and he's with another woman, his older daughter, Leah. And so he works another seven years, And here about this time, about 20 years have have passed, he fled from his childhood home because by deception, he stole his brother's birthright. His brother's name was Esau. He goes to Uncle Laban, and Laban deceives Jacob by giving him a wife he hadn't wanted instead of the one he'd served him for. And by this time, Jacob has become very wealthy. He has many sons. The 12 tribes of Israel were led and named after his 12 sons. He has daughters as well as his two wives and flocks and herds. And after 20 years, God directs him to go back home. Now he hears that his brother Esau is coming out to meet him with 400 men. Now given how he left, he does not assume this is a welcome party. He thinks his brother Esau feels he's coming to to make a claim on the property. So in great fear for his life, he sends gifts ahead. If you still got your Bibles open, look back to verse 13. The Bible says from what he had, he selected a, brother, a gift for his brother Esau, 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 male camels with their young, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, and 10 male donkeys. He put them in the care. This is important. Listen to this. He puts them in the care of his servants, each herd by itself, and says to his servants, go ahead of me and keep some space between the herds. He instructed the one in the lead, when my brother Esau meets with you and asks, to whom do you belong and where are you going and who owns all these animals in front of you? You are to say... They belong to your servant, Jacob. They are sent as a gift to my Lord, Esau, and he is coming behind us. He also instructed the second, the third, and all the others who follow the herds, you are to say the same thing to Esau when you meet him, and be sure to say your servant Jacob is coming behind us. For he thought, I will pacify him with these gifts I am sending on ahead. Later when I see him, perhaps he will receive me. Okay, so in great fear... He sends out these gifts. He sends them out in sections. Then he sends, dig this. See what kind of guy he is. He sends his wives and his children in front of him. It's literally using his family as human shields. So in case there is a slaughter, he can hopefully escape. What a guy. What a guy this is. If you look back a little further in verse 9, you kind of get some insight into his spiritual condition at, at, at this point. He prays this prayer and he says, God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Lord who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives and I will make you prosper. 
I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown to your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two groups. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I'm afraid he will come and attack me, and also the mothers with their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. This is maybe one of the most self-centered and manipulative prayers I see in mothers with their children. If he's so concerned with them, why isn't he in front of them? He's trying to make it seem like he's concerned with God's reputation. Lord, what are they going to say about you? You promised this. And if I'm slaughtered, I mean, I'm not worried about me, Lord, but what about your reputation? A man after God's own heart, someone who really wanted to see God's will done, would have gone ahead with the first section of gifts and trusted that the Lord would keep him until he fulfilled his promises. This is somebody, unfortunately, who's a lot more like we are than we'd like to admit. We like to think of ourselves in lofty terms, that we'd readily lay our lives down for Jesus Christ. But when the chips are down, we come up short more often than not. We say, I'd give everything for Jesus. But when the reality is in front of you, how do we act then? Hebrews 12, 4 says, in your struggle against sin, you've not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Here's the amazing thing. There are people in this world scattered about in different countries and in different churches and different denominations who do know the depth of their faith and have gone just beyond acceptance of the gospel and into the consistent state of transforming lives and being changed by the gospel. These are the consistent, dependable servants of God. You think of the word integrity. The root word for that is the same as the word integer. If you remember anything from your math classes, integer is a whole number. It's not a fraction. It is a thing complete in itself. And so the idea of integrity is there is not two U's. Right? Some of us have a, a, a U on, on Thursday night and a U on Sunday morning. We have a, a, a version of ourselves in the club and a version of ourselves in the church. We have a version of ourselves in the way we treat our spouses and a version of ourselves that we are around other people. That is an inconsistent person. That is somebody who is not going to be used powerfully. Remember Jesus said, when they asked him what the greatest command in scripture, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your strength. The totality of our being is surrendered to Jesus Christ. And I've seen people in every church I've led that God has gotten a hold of all of them. And some of them, I remember a young man, he, he, was, he was very, very, very smart young man. And he really didn't know what God wanted for him. But he just, he said one thing, I know I don't want to ever have kids. He said, I just don't like kids. He ended up running an orphanage in Guatemala. (laughs) Do not say to God. I mean, it's like, God, do not send me to Aruba, right? I mean, do not send me. If you tell God, I don't want to. I have another young man that I I had mentored, and and he, I've talked about this young man before. His name's Nick, and Nick was, he just got so fired up for Jesus. He, He hooked up with a group in Africa, but he wasn't just preaching in Africa like so many are. He would go out into the bush. He would go into places where his life would be in danger, preaching to, to Muslim people. And, and he would ride around, he, 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 this guy who was like a, a taxi driver with a scooter, and he would ride around, he'd say, hey, take me somewhere where they've never heard the name of Jesus. And, and the guy would say, hey, well, here's this, this village over here, and they don't have a church. He's like, no, 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 not, not they don't have a church. I want to preach where they have never heard the name of Jesus. See, you can hear these stories and you say, amen, you ought to be scared because if God has raised up people like that in every church I've led, you may be next, right? We just, we just pray saying, my heart has been in your sights, right? I mean, you better think about that before you sing that again, because you may be in God's sights this morning. Maybe you don't even believe really in your heart of hearts that you can or will be dramatically different six months or a year from now. And I know this because there are too many in the body of Christ that have been on the same spiritual level for a long, long time, and it's not a very, very high level. And it's why people serve kind of like in in a non-responsive way. They're kind of like, hey, I'll do God a favor. I'll do God a solid, right? That's not, we are to serve the Lord responsively to what he has done. I love because he first loved me. I serve because Jesus modeled it for me. But I've met many people in churches that kind of have this attitude like, hey, you know what, I'll do this, but, and then they start putting all these conditions on it. That is not the heart of a servant. If you're someone who has not seen a dramatic change 
in your willingness and in your hunger to serve Jesus, and I mean dramatic by biblical standards, there's like somebody, is, some, some husband in here is like, hey, I just started washing dishes, right? And that may be dramatic to your wife, but that's not, that's not really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about dramatic by the standard of God. This is where Jacob had his name changed from Jacob to Israel. This was the birthing place for him becoming the man and the servant of God that the Lord was calling him to be. You know, there's a saying that saved people serve people. Saved people serve people. But it's more than that. Some of us need to intentionally wrestle with God about becoming not just saved, but becoming the servant you're destined to become. And I see a few elements that have to happen in scripture for for that to occur. And the first is that we need to get truly alone with God. Verse 24 says that Jacob was left alone. This was an unintended consequence. He sends all his servants, he sends his wives, he sends his children, he sends his earth. Now he's alone. God had set up the situation so that the conditions would be in place for him to work in Jacob as he needed to. He had to set the table for the supernatural to get the natural out of the way. How many of you have fasted from the world lately? Not gone to movies, fasted from TV, turned off your phone, and spent some time getting really serious with God. I came across this verse the other day. Paul says, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit. Perfecting, that means bringing to completion holiness out of reverence for God. I'm, I'm sometimes shocked at the things we can put into our heads, the things that don't bother us in our culture. We're like the frog in the kettle. And, and, and the, the heat's being turned up and it's being turned up so gradually we don't even notice. And sometimes people go, oh, Pastor, you should watch this, you should watch that. And I'll challenge them on it. I say, let me, let me ask you a question. Would you go to, to, to downtown somewhere and pay a woman money to come to your house and take off her clothes for your entertainment? No, no, absolutely not. I'm saying, so why do you pay some Hollywood director to do it? Why would you pay a Hollywood director? Well, but pastor, it's not that bad. I'm just making sure I read that right. Purify ourselves, not pray about it. This is my job. Purify myself from everything. You know what everything means in the Greek? Everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting, bringing to completion holiness out of reverence for God. See, some of us, we want God to move. Hey, God, move in my life in a powerful way, but 15 minutes after we're done with that prayer, we start saturating ourselves with the world again. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind, all your strength. In other words, Jesus is saying, because he was asked the greatest commandment, And he's saying, if you get this one right, all the others follow. He said, there's a second that's like, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you're loving the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength, that's gonna flow because God loves people. See, if you're praying for a transformational move of God, one of two things has to happen. Number one, either we're gonna choose to get alone with God or we're gonna force the hand of God to where he has to remove things from your life that are getting in his way. And let me tell you, the first choice It's far less painful. Jacob chose the latter. He, a mere man, wrestled with the Lord till daybreak. First of all, Jacob was a man in his 60s probably by this time. He was not physically capable of wrestling with anyone all night, let alone God in the form of man. This is what is known to theologians as a Christophany. It is a pre-incarnate version of the Lord Jesus. Think of the fourth man in the fire. When God shows up in human form. And in this passage, we see a couple of important truths. First of all, God had to strengthen Jacob to be able to wrestle with him. Let me say that again. God had to strengthen Jacob. God had to give him the capacity to wrestle with him till daybreak. And secondly, God did not exercise his own ability to overpower Jacob. Why? Because it leads to the second element. The second thing we have to understand is that it means endurance. It means even loss or even suffering. In other words, get ready to limp. What did God do to Jacob that he could not have done in five minutes or 30 seconds? God could have defeated Jacob in no, you know, a second if he wanted to. 
God didn't put Jacob's hip out of place because he'd had enough. Dude, I can't go no more. I'm tapping out. I got to put your hip out. That's not, not, not at all. God could have defeated, ja- defeated Jacob, killed him, disfigured him, wounded him, blessed him in 10 seconds, let alone 10 hours. What was going on is that God was about to redefine Jacob's understanding of his favor. See, the first time Jacob went after a blessing, he dressed up in another man's clothes, lied to his blind daddy to steal the inheritance of his older firstborn brother because his mommy told him to. This this is not how you go. Some of us think, you know, if I want blessings, from, I got to make it happen. Look, there is a principle of sowing and reaping. If I work hard, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reap. But, but the truth is, when it comes to blessings, that is something that occurs in the favor of God. See, after Jacob had left his home, he was given a real blessing. He saw angels ascending to and descending from heaven. And he prays this prayer in Genesis 28, a few chapters earlier. He says, if God will be with me and watch over me on this journey I'm taking, and will give me food and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father. This sounds like a contract with like a half a dozen clauses. If God will do this, if he'll be with me, if he'll watch over me, if, if he gives me food to eat, if he gives me clothes to wear, so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. The Lord already was his God. The Lord is God of all. So you may be here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We don't make him Lord. He is Lord. We accept who he is. I challenge anyone, look into the history. Look into the the, the truth of the story and you will discover that who Jesus claimed to be is who he is. God wasn't showing up to change Jacob's theology. He was showing up to change his walk. And there's somebody I believe in this place. God wants your walk with Jesus to gain a limp because a limp symbolizes weakness. Paul says, I glory in my weakness for when I am weak, what? Then I am strong. There was a new understanding in Jacob after this day that that wound represented. A wound which, by the way, never disappeared. The church needs to lock onto the presence of God and say, I am not letting go. Individually and as a whole, Not letting go until something happens inside me and I'm never the same again. I was talking to somebody this morning uh, about this acrylic pulpit. Acrylic's pretty tough, pretty tough material. They use it even for to stop bullets and things. There's a story, and I can't remember if it's in the God Chasers or the God Catchers. It's by Tommy Tenney, and he was in a church, and it and and they they had two services, and they were in the early service. And the spirit of the Lord just came upon them. And they just began to cry out, God, we're so tired of church as usual. God, we want you to show up. We want you to radically transform us. And as they were praying, the pulpit itself split, cracked in half from top to bottom. They actually saved it to show people. Well, guess what? That service was running long. All the people waiting in the lobby for the 11, they poured in. They don't care if they had a seat. They just wanted to be a part of what God was doing because once that, once that change happens, once that shift happens in the spirit, once people get really, really hungry for the things of God and not for church as usual, you can never go back again. It, it permanently wounds the old you. It, it, it permanently changes. It causes the death of something within us. It gives us a new birth and of, of a tenderness born of the day we lost our wrestling match with God. See, I remember that day in my life. That, that I, I remember my wrestling match with God. I had taken a church in New England. They didn't have their own sanctuary they were renting. They didn't have a parsonage. They had never paid a pastor. They only had a handful of people. And I'm sitting in an economist. I still have a picture of my oldest girls, Bonnie and Stephanie, and they're out playing in the snow. And and it, it it was December. It was the snowiest winter on record. In, in Massachusetts. And, and they're playing in the snow. They're oblivious to it. I, was, I had a U-Haul truck that uh, I had rented from somebody who was in my church and, and they had given me like two weeks on it. They just said, you know, you don't know where you're going. So they just gave me all these extra days for free. And I was sitting there and I just, everything in me wanted to go home. I had a home I could go to in Florida. My father-in-law built. He'd never lived there. He slept there one night. He had hoped to retire there, but his, his mother got very much frail, and so she wanted to stay in her home. So he was living in, in that home several hours away. And I knew I could just drive to that house, get a part-time job, 
and wait for a church to come open because one of my best friends, he's one of my best friends to this day, we just were texting a few days ago, he was the pastor of the largest church in the denomination in that state. I just, I just drive down there and wait. And I, I, I'd love to tell you I was praying. I wasn't praying, I was whining. Telling God all the things. God, I have little kids. And, and, and I, we had, my son was a newborn. And, and we have, you know, I, they like things, luxuries like food. And, and so I'm telling him, giving him all these excuses. And he gave me one thing. He spoke to me as clearly as he spoke to Jacob. He said, you can't go anywhere else and tell people to trust me. If you leave here, and you preach, trust the Lord, you'll be a hypocrite. Everything that has followed in my life has followed from that day because I knew from that moment on, God, wherever you send me, I'm just gonna trust you, and he has always been faithful. But unless I had that match, let me share something with you here. You need to understand what wrestling with God really is because that word gets used so much, it's a joke. People say, I'm wrestling with God about something. In reality, they're not wrestling at all. That sin is kicking the snot right into their cerebellum. They're, they're, they say, I'm wrestling with the sin of pornography. Or I'm wrestling with, with giving, or I'm wrestling with giving up this. That's not wrestling. That's feeling a little bit bad about disobedience, but still being defiant to God with what he's requiring of you. Ephesians 4, 18 and 19 warns us about that. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to what the hardening of their hearts. See, 1 Corinthians 7 speaks of my intentionality in pursuing the holiness of God and getting everything out of my life that would hinder or obstruct what the Lord is doing. This speaks of people who have gone the exact other way, having lost all sensitivity, meaning at one point they had it. At one point they were sensitive to the leading of the Lord. At one point they knew what God wanted. They have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. In other words, once sin gets a hold of you, once you give yourself over, the Bible says a man is a slave to whatever's mastered him. Once you give yourself over, once you convince yourself it's not that bad, once you say, I'm just gonna keep pouring this stuff into my life, it's going to make you its servant. When you're actually wrestling with God, there will be a holy fear because you're gonna know that when that wrestling match is over, that sin or that characteristic or that weakness is going to be gone. That's a fearful thing because we may get pleasure in what we do, but we're defined by what we desire. Let me say that again. You may get pleasure in what you do, but you are defined by what you desire. That's why Jesus said, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Did you notice the second? He didn't say whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but who actually, who, whoever desires to lose his life, but actually loses his life. Whoever desires to save it will lose it. But when you actually give it up for me, you're going to find it. Some like Jacob, we want Jake blessings as cheap and quick as possible. God is not Timu. He's not Amazon. We need to stop praying for God to bless our specific requests but to move according to our actual spiritual needs. And too often, our lack of holiness and our self-focused lives make the world think that we're full of ourselves rather than full of Jesus. Rabbi David Wolpe, he's maybe the most prominent rabbi in the United States. He, he said this, I see no moral superiority to the Christian faith and its effects on the lives of those who follow it. Gandhi said, I love your Christ. It's your Christian's I don't care for. See, they're both wrong because there is a vast moral superiority when someone actually follows. But don't be too hard on him. The sad thing is, the guy may never have met somebody who actually really is following Jesus. And it leads me to the third element, and that is that God's favor requires a willingness to abandon the logical and the sensible life, or the sensical life, for the irrational walk of servanthood. When God said what he said to me, it made no sense. And then he did it again. Several years later, he asked me to go to this church. It was on the verge of closing down. The pastor said, the only thing this church needs is a wrecking ball. The building was a physical mess. It, I, I'll, I can show you a video. It was, it was just condemnable, literally condemnable. There was no money in the church. And, we, and, and, and when I got there, they were paying me you know, whatever they could, 100 bucks a week or something like that. And sometimes not even that. 
And God said to me, do not go and get a second job. I mean, I'll tell you, to even fill out a job application would have been like committing adultery. I would have been that convicted. He, I, it was just so clear. And so we didn't know what he was going to do. There was a week, we literally, we ex- exhausted our checking account and our savings account. And I was, I was literally gonna have to put groceries on, the, on a credit card when a check comes in the mail for $3,000. God just, he he just kept reinforcing this understanding that if I will turn it over to him, if I will serve as he has called me to, then he will bless and care for me. Didn't Jesus say that? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all these things will be added to you as well. Several weeks ago, I talked about the Hebrides Islands revival. It's maybe my favorite revival. But I, I came across this quote from the main speaker. And I, it occurred to me, I had not, I'd talked about it, but I had not read a quote from him. His name was Duncan Campbell. And I want to read something to you he wrote. You need to hear this because one line of this story could so change your understanding of God and his ability to use you, it's more than worthwhile. During this revival, thousands of people came to Jesus Christ. Some didn't even step inside a church building. There were people out in the fields in the middle of the day that just laid down their farming implements and and, and got saved. There were were church services that were going on two, three, four o'clock, five o'clock in the morning. There were people God was waking up from asleep and bringing them to church at like midnight, one o'clock in the morning. It swept, this revival swept an entire region before the days of mass media and obviously before the days of social media. And it began in the prayers, the brokenhearted prayers of some persistent worshipers. They didn't even have a pastor. And it was launched in one man's heart the day he wrestled with God and lost. So if you're waiting for the day where God needs you, I'll call you in about an eternity. But if you're wondering if God wants you, there's no doubt about it. Duncan Campbell says this, I'll tell you how the Hebrides revival started. It started in my study. Years before, I'd been a part of what they called the faith mission movement in England. Before I was married, I rode my bicycle all over England, spreading the gospel, preaching, and functioning as best I knew how. And those were the beginning of great days. Those were the seedbeds of everything I eventually became. In the process of that, I decided to go back to school and further my education. I came out at the top top of the dean's list and began to be called the Right Reverend Duncan Campbell. And I'll pause here to say that Duncan Campbell became the most renowned preacher in England at that time. The pinnacle event of the English church world was an annual national conference called Keswick Week. Only the best and brightest were invited to speak at it, and the right Reverend Duncan Campbell was the keynote speaker for this conference year after year. He was in his mid-40s. He'd entered what he thought was his prime. And he was working on his study, preparing sermons for another Keswick Week appearance when his 15-year-old daughter came in to see him. Now, daughters are known for their ability to speak the truth without really knowing the impact of what they're saying. I know as a father of four. As Duncan Campbell and his daughter talk, she asked this question, Daddy, why doesn't God use you like he used to? He said, I was preparing sermons. It knocked the wind out of my sails. I thought I was at my peak. I was preparing sermons I thought would affect all of, of England. So I put down my pen and I asked her, my dear, what is it you mean? She said, Dad, you've told me stories of what used to happen when you worked in the faith mission movement. Why doesn't God do that with you anymore? I made some lame excuse and tried to theologically talk through it so I wouldn't lose face in front of my daughter. I held my composure until she left the room, and when she did, I fell on my face and said, God, she's right. With my face in the carpet, I wept hot hot tears and said, God, if you will give me back what I had, I will do whatever you tell me to do. That is a dangerous prayer. Three weeks later, I was sitting on the platform at the conference. I had already spoken and was scheduled to speak again. And God spoke to me and said, get up and go to the Hebrides Islands, to the Isle of Lewis. I said, God, I'm supposed to speak. And he said, just as clearly as I've ever heard anything said, Duncan, on the floor of your study, you promised me that you would do whatever I asked you if I would give you back what you had. If you go, I will give it. Duncan Campbell left the platform immediately and leaned over to the conveners and said, I'm sorry, something has come up. I've got to go. Within three days, he was on the Isle of Lewis. When he stepped off the ferry boat and asked the pastor, the, asked for the pastor, the pounds people replied, there is no pastor. There are only th- three churches on the island. Two of them are closed, and one has some elderly ladies meeting in it with the postman. But if you're looking for a religious man, the postman is the one you'll be looking for. The postman was an elder in the church who basically held things together and served as an interim pastor. Duncan Campbell found the postman's house and knocked on the door, not knowing what to expect. The postman answered the door and immediately said, oh, Mr. Campbell, you're right on time. 
We have just enough time for tea before the meeting starts tonight. Over tea, he explained, the ladies and myself, we've been praying, and God spoke to us and said, you are coming. Six weeks ago, I printed posters that announced the meetings would begin tonight. Mr. Campbell told my English friend, it dawned on me at that point that God didn't really need me. He'd already prepared the revival, but he really wanted me. Church, it's real easy to talk about how much will be changed at the appearance of Jesus. But start talking about God telling you to quit your job and become a missionary or go into the pastorate or start giving more than you ever have or serve in an area that scares you and watch. I know because I've been there. Watch how fast the excuses start coming. The answer is simple. We need to truly wrestle with God. Think about it. He gave Jacob the ability and the strength to oppose him, just like he gives people the very breath that they use to curse his name because God had to, once and for all, deal with the entrenched areas of Jacob's life that kept him being the self-centered deceiver and manipulator that he was. You ever see those old movies in the Westerns and there's these two guys and you know what it's going to come to. And this town ain't big enough for the two of us. They're going to have it out. At some point in our lives, we need to go beyond just being saved. We need to have it out with Jesus, right? John, we talked about it a few weeks ago. He must increase, I must decrease. This town ain't big enough for the two of us. I have to, I have to be willing to, dis, to, to deteriorate and to diminish and, and, and allow myself to decrease. God has to finally, and somebody here you know, you and God need to have it out. Let me give you the ending. You're gonna lose. You're gonna lose. And that's the problem because the question we ask ourselves and we need to ask ourselves in the first place is, do I wanna make my life count for Jesus in ways beyond what I see and my own expectations. Duncan Campbell had to pray that prayer in his study before he got to his wrestling match on that platform. If you had asked him, or you would ask anybody, name the most influential person in England, his name would have come up. Of course I'm being exactly what God wants me to be. <clears throat> the truth is, God had a whole other level that he wanted to bring that servant to. And he would never have gotten there if he hadn't wrestled with God and finally said, okay, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll love who you want me to love. I just want to have all that you have for me. And he had been in that place before and he knew what it meant. And like I said, if you've ever been in a genuine move of God, if you've ever been in a real revival, and I'm sad to say too many Christians haven't, if you've ever been a part of one, you'll get discontent with churches as usual. You may say, okay, I understand that we need to, to sow, and I understand that we need to plant seeds, and I understand that we need to worship, and I understand, I get it, but God, I'm hungry for more. And that's when I see a kindred spirit who's been through that match with God has lost. Look, let's be honest. Nobody's getting saved just because you went to another Bible study. Nobody's likely to get saved just because you came to church this morning. But God might use you to lead somebody to Christ because you wrestled with him at church. You got in that wrestling match. You took the word home. Wrestle in your bedroom. I have no earthly idea of what God wants to do through that, any more than Jacob could have guessed or Duncan Campbell would have guessed what God would do later in his life. What I can tell you is that for most of us, our expectations of our lives are way too low because we haven't seen the depths of God's plan. God may give you a limp, but you need to want his blessings badly enough to make that trade. Come on, let's stand together right here. God, we look down the road to what you want us to be. God, you have to break what we were. You have to break who we are. And you have to show us, you have to give us a vision, God, because we can't see it. But Lord, before any of that comes, we need to get alone with you, just like Jacob did. Just like this elder and these elderly women did. We need to get alone with you. We need to seek your face. Church, I just want to ask you, this is praise team ministers, to go beyond just 
being an admirer of Jesus and move into the servanthood that God has ordained for you? Can you say to him, Jesus, I'll go anywhere you tell me. I'll do anything you ask. I'll give whatever you want. I'll love who you connect me with. I'll serve. And I'm willing to trade it all. If you can't say that, if you can't say yes to that, you need to have a wrestling match with God. This is praise team ministers. Engage him in that moment. In Jesus' name. Father God, every one of us has things in our lives and the accuser throws them in our faces, tells us we're not worthy, tells us we're not ready. But God, if we will give ourselves to you, Jesus, if we will abandon, if we will surrender ourselves to you completely, you'll take care of all that. You will give us your spirit. You will speak your truth. We do live on your word and we will be nourished by your word and by your spirit. So Father, I pray. Don't let us rest. Don't let us get comfortable as individuals or as a church until we are walking in the very call that you have ordained. We leave the past behind. We wrestle with you. What we were is not what we will be, Lord God Almighty. But Father, make us, shape us, mold us into exactly what your heart decrees for us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.